Welcome, every, everyone, to um, our first public event of the semester, the Brazil Initiative. My name is James Green. I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative and also professor of uh, history and, Lat and Portuguese and Brazilian studies. And what I'm going to do tonight, before I introduce our three panelists, is to give a quick overview of the situation in Brazil, which is impossible to do. It's going to be very superficial. It's going to be very rapidly done. But I'm assuming there are people who come to this forum with different levels of interest and curiosity about Brazil. But before I start, I want to make sure that I thank Ramon Stern, the program administrator of the Brazil Initiative, who put this program together and puts everything together for the Brazil Initiative, without whom we would not get anything done. So he deserves our applause. Thank you once again, Ramon. Um, so um, in, 19, in 2003, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva was elected president and was the first person from the center left to, uh, to occupy uh, the presidency in Brazil, if you think about it, since Getúlio Vargas in 1954 when he commits suicide. João Goulart comes to power in, in, in 61 because the president resigned. So if you, if you think back, Lula is the first person with the center left politics will come to power and will begin to implement a program which is a coalition between the center and the left, which has as its basis a democratic, social democratic vision for Brazil, believing in alliances with capitalists and a third path foreign policy, and relying on both imports and exports, but foreign banks for investments. And at that moment when he comes to power, soon after coming to power, there's high yields, there's the, the China boom, which will help uh, commodity produ production and help the success of his campaign. In his first term, there was uh, a, a scandal surrounding members of his party who were, um, because the Workers' Party did not have a majority in Congress, they basically purchased votes uh, and alliances for people uh, in order to guarantee a congressional majority in Congress. This was discovered. Uh, people were sent to jail for varying degrees of, of time for being involved in this kickback uh, vote-buying uh, event. And it's important to point out this is not the first time that Brazilian politics have done this, but this was really the first time that this was discovered and seriously criticized. And it, it caused to, there to be a crisis within the Workers' Party, uh, which had stood out as being unique and different from the other political parties. But nevertheless, Lula was reelected uh, for a second term. And in this time period, from 2002 to 2010, we see an increase in the minimum wage, a decrease in employment, and a real Grow, a growth and gross domestic product, which is one of the explanations why Lula left office with an optimism and the country was seen as, uh, you know, finally Brazil, the country of the future, was going to arrive at the future with all the possibilities. So this was a period of tremendous optimism and Lula left, I think, with an 80 or 90 percent approval rate, the highest approval rate, uh, rate of any president in the country. He handpicked his successor, Juma Rousseff, a former revolutionary, a guerrilla fighter imprisoned, uh, involved in uh, several jobs in, uh, as a technical functionary and uh, eventually, because of the Mensalão scandal, becomes his chief of staff uh, and is handpicked by Lula to succeed him. Um, she is elected for her first term and then in her second term is impeached, as we'll talk about basically. And her program is essentially similar to that of Lula with the caveat that she really relies highly on another political party, the PMDB, which she merged in the opposition to the military regime, it was founded in 1965. But by the time it builds this electoral alliance with the PT, it has lost its uh, ideological um, uh, profile and is a party that is more relying on guaranteeing its, sustain, uh, uh, its, its ability to continue to uh, be in power through building local coalitions with interest, uh, economic and political interests in the local level and then building a coalition with the Workers' Party to rule the government. Um, a, her program is also semi, uh, social democratic and like Lula's is, uh, is focusing to a certain extent on redistribution of certain wealth to the poor, a strong state in development projects, pro-market fiscal policies, and a, a, a different engagement in foreign policies, much less interested in really building alliances with third, the, the global south. And she has and her first year of her uh, first years of her presidency, tremendous popularity, uh, as Lula does when he leaves office. And this is compared to other uh, uh, people who uh, who preceded her. 
And then in 2013, there are a series of mobilizations. People are still debating what the nature of these mobilizations were in the country, what was the content, what was the purpose. They start out as mobilizations against the high cost of bus fares, an increase of 20 percent in bus fares, but quickly spread and develop a multiple um, facets to their content. Some people protesting because the promises that the Workers' Party had given the country had not been fulfilled. Uh, others uh, be on immediate uh, demands for improvement in education, transportation, public health, and the quality of life. Um, and then it takes on another tone by other people actually questioning the political parties and que questioning the Workers' Party and questioning uh, Gilma's uh, leadership as the president of the country. Uh, and while in the very beginning of these mobilizations they were organized by kind of radical uh, decentralized collectives of students, after they take on a mass uh, content, the media, especially the most important media, uh, shifts its opinion and starts supporting these mobilizations, especially as part of the, the people mobilizing are taking on an anti-PT stance. Nevertheless, in the 2000 and 14 elections, uh, Jilma uh, Husefi runs against a center-right candidate, and I didn't have a chance to read the newspaper today, uh, Ersun Evis, who just was suspended a second time for corruption from the Senate. Um, but he ran a very strong campaign from the center-right, building an alliance with other political parties, and Jilma won uh, with a margin of 3.5 million votes, uh, or 3.3 points. But it must be noted this is the closest electoral race since Brazil returned to democracy in uh, 1985, and the first election was in 1989. Um, it's important to understand that the elections are two uh, tiers, so the many candidates run in the first tier, and then the f two uh, top voting getting uh, people getting the top votes are run in the second runoff, and uh, and Gilma won. Now at the mean at the same time that this is happening, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a formatting problem. Uh, the federal government, the federal judiciary is starting to investigate a series of scandals connected to money laundering and uh, passing on money to political parties. Uh, 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 this is called the Lavo Jato, or the Operation Car Wash. It uh, initially is connected to politicians in the Workers' Party and other political parties, uh, but soon there's discovery of the involvement of uh, the state oil company and people involved in state entities that are skimming off money and um, putting it in their pockets or uh, passing it on to political parties to buy influence. This is led by a prosecutor named Sergio Moro, who becomes, uh, is the leader of the, 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 this operation uh, and will uh, every single day be bringing uh, charges against figures and uh, being involved in a, in a process which was borrowed from the Italians of plea bargaining and basically getting a person to uh, have a lesser sentence if they themselves uh, will give information about other people. So this is a way that many more people are involved in the accusations of corruption, money laundering, or influence buying, uh, as more and more people are under the net of, of uh, Lavo Jato and uh, brought to jail, uh, charged with uh, crimes, and then uh, have those sentences reduced or even uh, given freedom if they will, in fact, uh, gave names of other people. And on, on one hand, this is a way which allows the, the prosecutors to get information about people who might not give it. It's also an opportunity for people to make up information in order to avoid a long prison sentence. Um, with a divided Congress and a sector of the Congress being accused of being involved in uh, scandals uh, and corruption, especially the Speaker of the House, Eduardo Cunha, when it was clear that the Workers' Party was no longer going to support him and support an investigation in his uh, 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 being involved in corruption and, and having millions of dollars in a, uh, an offshore bank account in Switzerland. In Switzerland um, he accepts the demands that have been articulated by sectors of civil society for the impeachment of Jim Husefi. And, uh, these are uh, demands that happen right after the elections, or challenges to, to the election results, and then there's mobilizations by people who support the center-right coalition of Aysunevis, uh, essentially, uh, and will expand. The accusations are about uh, improper budgeting and budget accounting of funds that uh, the Congress has uh, uh, determined need to be handled in a certain way, 
with the accusations that she circumvented these regulations and therefore violated the will of Congress as the basis for the impeachment, known as pedaladas, or kind of shifting the money around in the budget. Um, at the same time, Lula is uh, detained uh, under charges of possible uh, corruption and receiving bribes or uh, 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 benefits but for, in, in turn, favoring certain companies. Um, and so the impeachment will happen in the Chamber of Deputies uh, in April. There will, she will, uh, President Dilma Rousseffi will be uh, t um, uh, asked not to step down from serving uh, until the Senate takes up the, the case and there's a voting. Um, the people supporting this, uh, in large part, um, but not entirely, are people of a core coalition within the Congress known as Bala Biblia y Boy, which are people who are in, kind of involved in law and order ideas and the, uh, the gun industry uh, in Brazil, people who are involved in kind of or linked to the evangelical Christian movements and people involved in agro-business um, who form a core of the opposition to Dilma. Um, in the Senate, she is tried and impeached. And in the meantime, Michel Temer, the vice president and the representative of the PMDB, uh, is the temporary president. Um, this is his first cabinet of ministers, widely criticized for being all white men of a certain age. Um, and after the impeachment, he will carry out a series of reforms, including changing uh, the social security system, reforming the consolidated labor laws of 1943, which encourages expanding independent contractors. Um, and uh, at the same time, there are increasing charges against Lula, leading to his being uh, indicted and convicted in the first um, instancia, what is that, the first, uh, in, uh, the, in the first court of, of, court of law, uh, for having received um, a, a, as a bribe uh, an apartment uh, in a uh, beach, beach apartment uh, and other charges against him. And uh, he is now appealing uh, that decision. And at this point, it seems, and this is one of the many questions we have, that the core center-right government, a uh, political party that is, the PSDB, uh, that um, has challenged the Workers' Party in recent elections, and the political system has been a balance between the two main core political parties, on one hand, the center-right PSDB, and on the other hand, the, the Workers' Party as a leader of another coalition. Um, the, it's, it seems, and this is my prediction, that if there are elections in 2018, someone from the PSD will likely be the candidate elected, but I'm very bad at predictions, so uh, you shouldn't pay attention to me. Uh, one of the other candidates who has been an important figure in the past is Marina Silva, uh, who uh, is part of a small political party that uh, was formed recently after she left the Green Party. Um, the, another kind of controversial candidate is Shai Bolsonaro, who uh, represents a very hard right uh, political movement. Uh, which is very problematic from, from many points of view, uh, but his, has significant popularity in, in the population. Uh, and then even people are talking about the possibility of someone like Sergio Moro being a candidate for the president in 2018. Lula, if, he is, uh, if he, his, his appeal is not successful, he will not be eligible for, to run in the, 18, the 2018 elections. And there's a big question mark about what his fate will be as well. So Brazil is not in a good place at this point, I think. I think there's a political crisis, a crisis of confidence in uh, the political system and politicians, a strong sense by many people that all politicians are corrupt, that the uh, situation in the country is, is very dismal indeed. So what, I, I don't know if that was a, will be helpful to people, but what we've done tonight is brought three people together to speak on the situation in Brazil from different angles, from different perspectives, from different ideas. Each is going to be allowed to speak only 20 minutes, and uh, then we're going to open up for um, a debate, opportunity for people to ask questions and answers. We're predicting this is going to last from till 9.30. People should feel free to leave quietly if they need to leave earlier than that, but that's the plan for the night. So I'd like to call three people to the table, and then I'll introduce them in, at, at the same time. So first, Abner Saltinos. Please. Then Claudio Biato. 
And then we're doing a Brazilian style tonight. And then Vera Paiva. We didn't, we didn't sing the national anthem, but we could have. Um, so I, I want to introduce all three of them now, and because you get a sense of who our panel is. And then I'm going to let them speak in order, and I'm going to be brutal about time. Um, so if I can sit between Claudio and Vera, so if you sit at the end so that I can control the time a little better. OK. So um, Abner holds a BA and an MA degree in history from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And his, uh, he's done research uh, on the military dictatorship uh, and worked with the state Truth Commission of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he has been a visiting scholar at Brown last year and this year um, and would love to stay longer at Brown if, if fate takes him in that direction. Um, he works on the military dictatorship, popular social movements in Brazil, the history of Baixada Fluminense, which is a working class and poor neighborhood of, 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 of the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. And I had an opportunity to meet him four or five years ago at a defense of another student in, in, uh, in, in Rio, and I was very impressed by his, his enthusiasm and interest, and he came highly recommended. And so we wanted to include him on the debate, on the, on the panel tonight. Claudio Beato is a professor of sociology at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, where he is the director of the Center for Crime and Public uh, Safety Studies. He has produced dozens of articles, I think 36 articles, many books and book chapters. He has served as a visiting uh, fellow in many places, including the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., the David Rockefeller Center at Harvard, and currently he is the Ruth Gaidojo Chair uh, of Brazilian Studies at Columbia University. Vera Paiva is a professor at the University of Sao Paulo in Social Psychology Department, and she has been a coordinator in the Interdisciplinary University of Sao Paulo Nucleus for the Study of AIDS Prevention since 1981, and I must say she was one of the first psychologists to really deal with people with HIV AIDS. She's also the daughter of Juven Paiva, a former Brazilian congressman who was arrested, tortured, and disappeared by the military dictatorship in 1971, and in this capacity, along with her mother and her brothers, her brother and her sister have been very, very involved as an intransigent fighter for human rights uh, and justice in Brazil, including serving as the civil society representative to the, Brazil, the Brazil's National Council for Human Rights. And she is currently a visiting professor at Brown through the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. So we're going to start. They, they deserve another round of applause. So um, we're going to start with Abner, who will be speaking. And then we're going to move to Claudio and then to, uh, to Vera. And maybe Ramon will help Abner get his PowerPoint ready, if that's possible. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to share my ideas with you um, on this subject. I want to thank Professor James Green and uh, especially Ramon Stern, Antonio Taylor, Flavia Soares, and Larry Britt for assisting me by reading these texts before my presentation. The title of my presentation is First, we get height of Dilma, read of Dilma, and the work party, then comes the rest. This was, was the slogan that mobilized the supporters of the overthrown Dilma government. Later, it was reappropriated by critics of impeachment when Temer government began to take away social rights and the past laws to expand deforestation of the Amazon, to, ex, uh, to use public funds, funds to buy off the parliament in order to shield the president for investigation into his own crime, eliminate the representation of women 
and the black Brazilian high level government position reduced the federal budget in the areas of health, education, science, and technology, freezing the investment in this area for the next 20 years. The process that culminated in the impeachment of President Rousseff was well analyzed uh, by delegations sent to Brazil by the Latin American Study Association, LASA, which resulted in a report on the 100 page which I invite to access. My point of view to consider the impeachment as legally defensible because it was followed, uh, followed judicial formality, legal ritual is questionable at best. Rather, it involved legal maneuvering behind with several politi political actor play key roles, namely the Brazilian parliament and the judicial system, which was inflated in importance by sectors of the mainstream media in Brazil, which is controlled by a few family, the financial sectors and the substantive sectors of the middle class that mobilize state capital across the country. Therefore, out of this and in a coup d'etat sui generis. This kind of a coup d'etat without immediate of use of military violence, as previous practices in Latin America has been mobilized in the region in the case of Honduras in 2009 and the Paraguay in 2012. In both countries, the, establish the establishment of a new presidential coalition was followed by the repression of popular social movement, including the assassination of peasant and indigenous leaders, the increasing militarization of police force with the goal of repressing those resisting the coup, appropriation of lands and the natural resource by foreign companies, the adoption of the trade and the true liberal policy characterized by privatization of a key business and of public education and the greater overall stability of a democracy institution. While these contexts are different, they are useful segue into the Brazil situation. Thus, I am arguing is that the coalition that gained power in May 2016 in Brazil came bearing a state project the past. Let me explain. The discourse of modernization or adjustment of Brazil to the model of a so-called modern economy was often mobilized by different actors and lent itself to different interests. This conservative thought process and the policies adopted in this name, in its name, almost always were followed by a divorce between the interest of popular class and the big business or between capital and uh, labor. Historically, it is no difficult to map this conservative thought. It is to strengthen by the idea that the Brazilian people must make sacrifice for period of economic turbulence to pass. The military dictatorship used the metaphor, metaphor that the cake had to grow in order to be distributed. More recently, ex-president Fernando Henrique Cardoso commented on the document launched Temer Party, the PMDB entitled, 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 A Bridge for the Future, or in Portuguese, Uma Ponte para o Futuro, by stating, 
Give the circumstance, said Fernando Henrique Cardoso. Give the circumstance in Brazil following the impeachment, what we have to do is cross the river. This is a bridge. It may be a fragile, not more than a plank, but it is that we have. Progressive thoughts provide another perspective that modernization is only possible by reducing social inequality and the broadening the representation of a popular class, among other points. The policies of Lulupetismo, Lula and the large PT Workers' Party followed this progressive mood through 2014 and was characterized, among other things, by conciliatory logic between capital and labor, structured by the idea that everyone should win, popular class and the upper middle class and capital. Even in business sectors would win much more. It appeared to be a formula to appease both Greek and Trojans. We know that this did not work, especially after 2014, but not exclusively then. In this case, before Brazil was affected by economic crisis, beginning 2013, the dissatisfaction of numerous social sector of this policy model indicates that it had been exhausted. This model, in fact, seemed to have exhausted, much more, much more by going against expectation and the interest of upper middle class and the sector of the business community, especially tied to the Federation of Industry of the State of Sao Paulo, a FIESP, then actually go against the interest of the popular class. Victorious in 2014 election and believe that she could count on some patience for the electorate and, sir and her sympathizer, supported by 54 five-point million voters, Dilma government sought to respond to the demand of a financial capital. She sought refuge in the very same logic of a conservative thought, to ask for the population to sacrifice themselves for the sake of patience. President Rousseff wished to appoint Luis Carlos Trabuco, financial CEO of the largest private Brazilian bank, as her financial minister, but turned her down, and so she chose Joaquim Levy, also a director of the same bank, who had been part of the Cardoso and the Lula government and the economic team. With the caveat that belt tightening would cut any rights from the population under the slogan, no fear rights. The low starting, the austerity began. Though the name of a new minister and the austerity policy pleased the mainstream press that had harshly, that had harshly criticized the government and apparently had appeased the rest of the conservative camp. The honeymoon did not last long. Therefore, the question remains why, with the gesture towards the conservative camp, Dilma gov Dilma's government undergo the impeachment. Here, I return to the tease I hope to support he, that the conservative coalition that took power in May 2016 in Brazil has a state project that took uh, that evasion, that return of traditional elite to run the state and to control the economy. Beginning on August 31st, 2006, with the definitive removal of ex-president 
and by extension the Works Party, the, the country was no longer at a crossroad and went back at least to the 1980s. It is not be chance to in uh, it is not be chance that in the rhetorical of those who supported the overthrow of government and even in the analysis of experts, there is an insistence on the continued function of institutions as if we were at the impasse during the end of 80s. While institutions continue to function, there has been loss of the kind of democracy that was unthinkable six or seven years ago. This argument that institutions are working today implicitly reveal Brazil conservative camp view and the mean of democracy. It also reinforces the idea that a formal and institutionalized democracy is enough, preferably with very little work class participation. The project that underpinned the policy of the new coalition, principally led by the political part, PMDB, PSD, Democrats and PSDB is the document I refer previously, A Bridge to the Future, in Portuguese, Uma Ponte para o Futuro. One of its author was Roberto Brant, an uh, ex minister of the Cardoso government in the area of pensions, who, quote, who wrote, quote, this document the Ponte para o Futuro uh, was not written to win the vote of the popular class. This is not the kind of a program you bring to elect and quote. Brandt's clean ordering at least revealed the arrogance of the traditional political elite and its contempt for the ability for the population to decide for itself what it wants. It is as if the electorate were incapable to understand the supposed good intention of the new government, or even incapable of deciding their future, the same old conservative mind. To conclude, the current situation we have in Brazil is similar to the situation after a or the pillage and uh, hand sinking of a public patrimony and the attacks on social and political rights. These are the central characteristics of the current context. I scorted it, earth will follow. The economic crisis and the insistence that Brazil has failed its state has given the conservative camp the opportunity to take away rights. They have done so through buying off member of the parliament, extravagantly expanding the judiciary, increasing the budget in area that will soon be privatized, such as the Minister, the Ministry of the Mine and Energy and the counteracting the impetus of the military to intervene by restoring their pensions. Unlike that they are doing with the rest of the people affected by the reform of Brazil retirement system. Additionally, additionally the anti-corruption rhetoric has filled the politicization of the judiciary, which has become a strong partisan and has chosen its own heroes. Whether it is the Japanese of the, or the hipster of the federal police, the prosecutor Dalton Dallagnon, the judge Sergio Moro, or the president of Supreme Federal Court, Carmen Lucia, even though they are 
represented as people with a strong, strong moral and a vocation for elimination corruption. Simple search into their background reveal that they are as involved in shady activities as the people they accusing, arresting, and condemning. There is also a, a growth in the conservative camp in Brazil today. A new Brazil right or a nova direita brasileira that wants engage in sexist, racist, and anti-democratic discourse in private uh, meeting, but today are not longer ashamed to do so in public. Uh, they course the attendees at exhibition by claiming that they are immoral. They keep watch over teacher in the classroom. They lobby for censorship of plays, musical performance, and they want to control the content of professor teaching and the student freedom of thoughts. I am a pessimist about uh, the next eight or 10 years in Brazil, even though I wish I could be more optimist. The 2018 election are under threat, not only of not happen, happening, but to be empty of any content. The scrapping of public universities is well on its way and we'll have declaration of, uh, from a member of Supreme Federal Court that affirm that those institutions ought to be privatized as Supreme Court Judge Roberto Barroso has already said in the case of State University of Rio de Janeiro, a wedge. The recent, de the recent declaration of Army General Hamilton Moron, that upper command of the military has a plan for an intervention was reinforced by official communique of the commander in chief of army, General Villas Boa, in which he was not condemned for his declaration. Instead, his statement has raised the fear of military intervention being called for the a minority of the conservative camp. Amen. I believe that political system, that tax system, and the social security in Brazil require reform. The question is, who will benefit from the reform in Brazil? And, one, and wonder what basis or, present, or pretense will be done must be discussed. So, similarly, uh, the aversion to Lulism is not merely because the Mensalo scandal or corruption in Petrobras. Because if it were the case, they would protest against Pedro Parente, uh, the current president of Petrobras, who has dismantled Turn out the company to foreign capital. So, to conclude, Lulismo also brought the question, the main question nowadays in Brazil is because the PT police has put in center different group that in the past was abandoned by the government in Brazil. Special black people who have faced a really, a really uh, massacre in Brazil nowadays. The massacre of youth in Brazil, the black youth in Brazil, was put in the center of the question in PT government. Also, the right human was put in center of the discussion. I know, we know that this question was resolved, resulted, but it put in the center of the discussion. So I would like to thank for everybody uh, and uh, let's uh, use our time to talk about this other, other top uh, that we could talk now. Thanks so much.
Okay, um, thank you, good night. Thank you for the invitation, James. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a nice city, wonderful university. It's a pleasure to be here for my first time here. Well, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, one another face of the, our political crisis that have to do with a subject that was end up hiding by the agenda, the political agenda and economic agenda now, nowadays in Brazil. This is a pity because this is an old problem and it's becoming worse. I will talk about uh, uh, crime and violence in Brazil. I will give you an overview, some figures, uh, what's happening exactly in terms of some explanation about our institutional capacity policy reform especially and to point out that things are changing. This is important because I'm optimist with things that are happening in Brazil in some sense. I think that we are seeing some good signals that things are changing. Well, some figures. Uh, we have a lot of people die in Brazil, uh, 60,000 people die every year. A uh, victim by homicide is almost un, unplanned with 150 people fall down every day. This is the equivalent, is uh, huge numbers. And uh, uh, in terms of fear, Brazil is one of the countries where the people feel more fear to live there in this country. No? And just to have uh, some data to compare, and Brazil is most violent in death in Syria in war. There is more people dying in Brazil than in Syria now. Uh, in the last five years or four, four years, we have more people, 200,000, 8,000 uh, people dying there. Is this a war? Well, this is images of the last week in Rio de Janeiro. We can see the armies in the streets. They are doing public security, public safety. And this is the regular police doing policing in, in Brazil. It's, uh, 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 it's not exactly uh, uh, the usual way that police goes to the street, but in Rio de Janeiro, in some parts of the city, this is happening. These are the numbers of homicide. It's increasing a lot, never stop it. We have, uh, 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 since 98, we have uh, about 1 million and uh, fi 500,000 people that die in Brazil. No? And, and we, we have this increase happening just in some regions in Brazil that where, where the, the federal government uh, invests more in the northeast of the region. Of the, Brazil, of the country. In the North Swiss region, the federal government has invested a lot of money because of Lula, uh, he did the infrastructure and built a lot of things. And the usual victims are always the same, are black people, youth that are dying, uh, and, and this never change, black and male and youth. <coughs> and firearms are one of the main causes of this kind of death is happening in the country. Uh, well, there, is a, there are some different uh, crimes in, in happening in, in Brazil that is very important to understand the fear that people feel uh, when they walk in the streets. You know? And the big cities in, in Brazil are very, uh, uh, the fear is, is becoming one of the most important inhabitants in the cities. No, and this is the reason because we have a lot of assault, we have a larceny, fraud, car accident, robbery, robbery especially uh, cellulars that are robbing the downtown areas of different cities of the country. No, and what is happening? We can see on the intra level, urban level, uh, especially urban characteristics of violence. This is important to understand what is happening because violence is not universal and it is, doesn't happen for in, in, in all social groups uh, in Brazil. Uh, there is one thing is important is that crime happens very concentrated. We can call this uh, a Pareto's distribution or a zip law distribution of the crime. This, for example, we have my city is divided in eight 
1,000 uh, census tract, and only 26, uh, six, eight census tract are responsible for 20% of the violent crime in the city. This is distribution, and this is the map where the violent crimes happen. We gonna see that this the same phenomenon happens, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, in other cities, São Paulo. Is the, I think that is correct. Is of all cities in the world. No? In Rio de Janeiro, for example, we have a, uh, an interesting phenomenon that is related about an if contagion effect that is happening in the city. What does it mean? That it means that neighbors that are very violent, they are becoming, uh, they, they have another neighbors that are becoming violent, and neighbors that are safer, they have another neighbors that are safer. This is a a kind of effect of contagion. This is a, a technique no, that in the health you use is the Moran. No? And we, when, when we analyze what's happening inside the city, it's interesting because the effect of socioeconomic variables is completely different. For example, this is to say, this is using a technique of geographic weighted regression where we can see that the effect of socioeconomic characters is different in different parts of the city. Uh, to understand uh, more easily, we can say that unemployment is different when this happens in one favela or when this happens in another neighbors in the city. The effects are different, and, and this is important to have a more focused politic, public policy. Another important uh, aspect is that, uh, that we call the uh, <coughs> segregation, spatial segregation in the city. This, is a, is a picture by Sao Paulo where you, when you cross a street, you enter into one of the poorest areas in the city and the other side is a, a rich area in the city. This is very common in our cities. Rio de Janeiro maybe uh, have a, some of the worst situation this because we have the morros, you know, the favelas that is in the middle of uh, high middle class. Well. And we have another explanation about this, is that economic and uh, political crisis. This is true. Uh, there is a fiscal, fiscal crisis and public security that is affecting the capacity of our governance to make a, a, a good management of their resources. But this can play, for example, rising rates on property crimes. And what about employment? This is not so clear how unemployment can be affected the uh, crime rates. We have to, the results shows that it is ambiguous situation. No, there is another aspect that is interesting is uh, about the effect of the crisis, especially economic crisis, in the drug market. People doesn't have mo not money to buy uh, drugs, and this means that some of the drug dealers are going to another kind of crimes to make their their money, for example, they are robbing more in the streets and this is causing a lot of disruption in, in our cities. There is, of course, a problem that we have the lack of political leadership. We haven't a political leader now to, to try to solve this situation. This is a huge problem, despite the fact that I think that we never had this kind of political leaders in Brazil. In the last 30 years, Problem. This is, was a no problem for political society. In Rio de Janeiro, it's interesting because for a while we we had a decline in the in the homicides when we see uh, this period, and especially regarding the the, the question what uh, of some project that they did in some favelas, especially the UPPs, was an important project that declined the crime rates. Rio de Janeiro was one of the worst city in the in the world in terms of crime, but uh, it's not it's it's really result uh, not not only UPP but the 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 investment that the government did in the public security sector was important, and the results are this: we can see that a situation where the personal crimes are declining, but uh, property crime is increasing. And we can see this in the graph. And this happens in all the country. What does it mean? Property crimes are crimes that are more prone to be affected by the capacity of management of the public security sector. 
And well, in this situation, we have to be more creative, especially we need more science to deal with this crime problem. This is one of the things that we have. We have to go beyond witchcraft and healers. It's, it's not uh, a simple. No, there is an idea that engineers like that when you have, when you are using strong force, if it's not working, you have to use more force. You know? And this is the idea that they are doing in Brazil. You know? we, we, we lost the capacity to build some preventive project, then we are losing more strength, using the armies to do uh, public safety. On the contrary, I think that we need more evidence-based project. And this means changing the usual way to patrol operation. I'm not talking like here about the preventive project because this is another conference that we I, I can do you know, in another time. But just talking about the management of this sector in Brazil. This is one of the problems that we have is the mismanagement. And, and we have to change it. Why? Because we have some dimensions of social control that are important. One of them is institutional, institutional matter when we are talking about uh, try to solve the crime problem. Institutions mean the criminal justice system, uh, especially police in the case of Brazil. I will show some data about this, but also the criminal justice, the judges, prosecutors, and the prisons in Brazil. The prisons are part of the, our problem because we have a lot of crisis in, in the prison system in Brazil. We have another aspect regarding social dynamics, individuals, and organizations. You know? And to understand what happens in terms of criminal structure uh, activities, we have to understand the opportunities where crimes happen, not only from the point of view of the individuals, and the social disorganization that happens in some parts of the city, and this is an important component to understand the crime. This, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, again, a Pareto's distribution of violent crime, we can see the 50% of the MAPE occurrence uh, occurring less than 5% of the area of the Rio de Janeiro. No, these are the areas. And we can see some variables vari that are important to understand. In each area of Rio de Janeiro, the part north of the city, we have different uh, indicators that explain crime distribution. In other parts of Rio de Janeiro, we have uh, other different indicators explaining uh, the crime ri rates there. And another important question is, are our criminal justice organization able to fight this challenge? This is our big question in Brazil in terms of public security. It's because in Brazil we always believe that we need a one-shot solution, is try to solve this in, 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 in one echo. The first thing that we have to think is about reforming the police. This is the usual police that goes in the favela in Brazil. They look like armies entering into uh, enemy territory. And well, there is a, a, rec a recurrent shortcomings in police organization. For example, institutional rigidity is, is a problem because our constitution will say that we have to have two different police, the military police and the civil police. And we have this, uh, have, uh, have gave, gave orange for uh, our problems of a juridic isolation uh, and culture between the police. One is very military and another is very juridical police. We have a low degree of effectiveness. I will show some data, it's shocking when we see the problem of homicide that only 8% uh, of the people go to jails when they commit homicides. No, the impunity is not only for the rich people but for poor people that commit crimes like this. No? We have a, a problem with institutional fragmentation and rivalry and police difficulty in civil control because we have a low accountability. No police is not, not only police, but in general, the criminal justice system, they are not accountable for other people, prosecutors, judges, and police. No, there is no civil oversight mechanism for them. And this is, for example, uh, just to illustrate this problem, we have the homicides in my city, Belo Horizonte, attempted and consummated. 
and Belo Horizonte, we have uh, more than uh, 21,000 homicides happened there, but only 20% uh, uh, began a penal investigation. That means that 80% of the homicide we lost in this process where the crime happens and the police begins to investigate. What happens here? No? And denounces by prosecutors is just 14% or, or the 6% we were lost in, in, this, in this process. Finally, uh, judges have a decision about 1,700 uh, cases and just 6% were condemned. This is a shocking number. We f when, when, we seek in terms, when we think in terms of uh, property crimes, the situation is even worse. Or what's happening exactly here? Where the police fail and to make a good investigation or to conduct uh, uh, this problem to the other uh, police? <clears throat> well, uh, there is a lot of things we can discuss this, and, but there is some positive signals. Now, I think that we have a good opportunity to change the situation in Brazil. The first one is that cities are beginning to enter into the problem of the security problem. You know, like in countries like Colombia, we have more mayors that are concerned with the crime problems and they are trying to put their municipal guard. In Belo Horizonte, for example, we have a, a municipal uh, that is around in three axes, integration, municipal and prevention project. This is, for example, the room where the people manage the crime problem in the city or is a evidence-based politics to manage the crime problem. And uh, we have a lot of integrated operation with other organizations that use uh, crime mapping to identify the hot spots and then they plan the operation based on these uh, findings. You know? And the result is very interesting. When we compare the last year, the first six months of the last year with the first six months of this year, we can see a decline in all kinds of crime. This is important because it's the unique city in Brazil that is declining their crime rates. And the same happens in about uh, when you compare Belo Horizonte with uh, Minas Gerais in general. And justice changing. There is a lot of controversy about the Operação Lava Jato, but it's important to understand, no, I'm not going to enter into the, 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 the Lava Jato. I, I don't want to discuss this, but it's important that this is an important change in terms of the culture, the juridical culture in Brazil, especially because Brazil in general is a, there is a civic, uh, <coughs> uh, civil law, no, uh, culture, and then it's changing more and more to a common law system like in the United States. And this is one of the reasons, because in Brazil, the Brazilian justice very, what, what some expert calls the loosely coupled system, or we have different logics inside each organization. For example, judges, if you get the judges that are in Curitiba, they are more crime control, juridical culture. If you get judges, for example, uh, from Brasilia and the Supreme Court, they are more a rule of law judges. And this is important, the difference that we are saying, the idea to work with a task force no, the, the important thing about the Lava Jato is that they are working together, not one each another. One, one, no, they are not fighting themselves, like in the case of uh, the usual way that justice work. And we have the plea bargaining that was an important uh, uh, tool that they introduced in Brazil. Uh, Curiously, it was uh, Dilma herself that introduced the plea bargaining and was victim of them now because it was victim of, of, of the charges in there. Well, some data, it's, it's impressive. No, you have a lot of criticism about the way that they work, but we have the current president was indicted for passive corruption. We have two former presidents, Lula and Dilma, that have been convicted for passive corruption, one indicted, another uh, convicted. We have several former governors. We have a chief of staff of president. We have a lot of data. Uh, indicated that they are changing the way 
of the justice worker. It's the for, it's probably the first time that we have rich people inside jails like the photos that were. Okay. And well, uh, there is some criticism. We can discuss this because this is a way. The important thing is that I would like to uh, point to that these judges and, 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 and prosecutors that are changing this were training here in USA, especially in Stanford and Harvard, and they changed their minds using more common law strategies to make criminal justice. This with the idea that the people in Brasilia are fed up with the corruption, but fed up also with crime problems, explain a lot what's happening in Brazil. Thank you. Hello? Hello, hello, hello. It's difficult to talk because I'm qu quasi into the discussion already, you know, after listening to the two people who talked before me. And uh, it's also because uh, I'm not a scholar on conjuntura, con uh, analysis de conjuntura, on, uh, I'm not a political science, uh, I'm a political activist, and I'm here as a scholar, and so I'm, I'm uh, I would jump immediately to the discussion. But I've, I decided that I would do exactly that, opening three uh, things for us to discuss. The, and if I get time to, to the third one. The first one is impeachment for what? Or what they are doing with the impeachment. I'm, I'm totally agree with uh, the first speaker who said that it was not about corruption because most of the people who in power now are totally involved in, 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 in corruption, <laughs> right? And, but, and it's not about a program that was elected, uh, and uh, Michel Temer was the vice, vice president of Duma, but he was not elected with the program he's providing. So I'm, I'm giving you some thoughts about what they are doing, impeachment for what. Second, I want to talk about people with fear, that's something that you talked about, and people without fear, literally people sem medo, who are in the streets resisting the situation. And if I have time, I'd like to, to uh, finalize discussing uh, the media, social media, and the path to or the means to the debate to think about the future of the country. I'm very pessimistic right now. In fact, I'm depressed. I feel like I'm in depth with the younger generation in my country because my generation fought a lot against dictatorship and for social justice, and we did commit a lot of errors. And <coughs> And I should say that I do not only speak on, on, on my own experiences with dictatorship and fighting the dictatorship, but I'm speaking from the position of a person who fought to build a new country, uh, who fought to build the new constitution, first the, the put it in place, and to put into the constitution some things that my speciality could contribute. For example, I worked a lot during the 80s through the health reform to be, be built into the constitution and the right to health, uh, the <coughs> mental health reform, and all sexuality, gender, and, and racial uh, things uh, and assets in, into our constitution that is known as the human rights constitution, right? Uh, I have, since the constitution was on, as a professional, contributed to uh, AIDS politics of all governments, since Sarney, in fact, I was, since the beginning of the AIDS. So I didn't, I was trying, and a lot of people in my generation was trying to build a country with public policies uh, based on human rights and building the SUS, you know? 
Um, and the, the, my, the public, SUS is the, the Sistema service. Unico de Saúde, which was uh, has been be, been built since the ni 1990 with its 27 years of, and it covers 96 percent of the country. And it's impressive the way we could do it in 27 years. It's uh, with a huge country like we have. So I, I will give you two, some scenes of my experiences in this last period that we are talking about that can make our discussion productive. Uh, I, when I was participating at the National Human Rights Commission and I was elected as a, as a representative of the civil society, right? It's, it's a, a half governmental and half civil society as any uh, national commission should be. I saw the impeachment of Dilma. I was there <laughs> through the impeachment process and through the same, the first months of Temer government. So I could provide for a big and organize a big conference on H human rights where I was fighting Dilma because she was aligned with some uh, LGB, uh, some uh, religious uh, fundamentalists sometimes, and uh, and and uh, not going uh, to the end, what uh, to human rights to transgender people in that Congress in particular. So I was fighting for her staying as a president <laughs> against impeachment, but also debating with her as a human rights activist. That's what I want to point it out. And then I saw the, minist the new Ministry of Justice, which is Alexandre Moraes, who, uh, who is fi fi 55 years old, uh, was uh, a professor in my university with a lot of suspicion of many of his academic career, very troubled, uh, bringing a general and a coronel is that English, to our human rights meeting, of the, uh, the, the meetings of the Human Rights Commission, to threaten us with a presence of the general. There was no way any general should sit in that council, in that meeting, and we had to have him at the meeting for two days, like looking at us just after the impeachment was done. This is scene one, right, of my experiences with this process. Yeah. We weren't fearing anything. People in that commission are very high level activists for human rights, but this was a very deep sign. And we had two people in the commission. One was a lawyer from OAB, which is the National Lawyers Association, Lawyers Association who supported the impeachment who was horrified at that moment and changed his position at that meeting, <laughs> you know, just looking at what was happening in the Justice Ministry of Justice. This was scene one of my, the experience I want to share with you. I will give you more scenes. I love scenes. <laughs> That's my unit of analysis in my scholarship. So second uh, scene and uh, is like, I myself hearing a comment on, on YouTube about the new budget uh, of the 2018 budget, right? When you see the budget proposal, you understand the priorities of a government. They already have talked about what is going on in many areas, right? But let's see what is going to happen next year when the Pecky da Morte, which is the death uh, law proposal that is that is uh, how do you say that it's, it's it was sent uh, to the Congress to cut the budget to freeze the budget the social budget for 20 years right what is going to happen in 2018 right first of all uh, this destructor adjustment means that 97 percent of the money that goes to Sistema Único de Assistência Social, that would be the unified system of uh, social care and support. I, do, I can't mm -hmm. not translate that in, in English. Would be cut in 97%, right? So we will have only 3% of the traditional money, of the last year money, to do. Bolsa Família, <coughs> which is uh, the funding for for families who, who doesn't have food on their plate, right? To fund 
which is this, the basic uh, program of this kind of program, unified system. So we are cutting from 14 million people to, to 12,000 million people uh, in the Bolsa Familia program in a huge crisis where you have 12% of the unemployment, right? When we should be putting people into the Bolsa Familia program, not taking them out, right? We will have 3.5 uh, million more people in the hunger map. We were out of the hunger map three years ago, four years ago. We, we will have, we will add three and a half million people in there, right? Uh, the special programs related to the Sistema Unico de Assistência Social uh, are uh, programs for the old, for the children, for the disabled, and for crack uh, use and drug addiction programs, and for uh, disabled people. Right, they are all in this pack, so th they will have only three percent of the traditional of the last year budget, which was cut a lot from the traditional one. If you think about education, forty percent of technical education, high school technical education, is cut. Uh, it, the cut is forty percent of the budget. Basic education, forty-two percent, and forty-six percent of the budget of universities. I must say that I find that this big investment on uh, high school and university education, well, it is a very important crisis management. Why? Because if young people don't have jobs, and they don't right in this crisis, they have something to do with their time. They are not preys of drug trafficking, of violent business, of any other kind of business. This was a very successful policy, I think, throughout Brazil to bring uh, economy movement in small cities around the country, public universities, and especially it's a crisis manager for youth. If you think about what is happening in Europe with 25% of unemployment in, in the youth and what does happen with this youth that is there without nothing to do, right? It's a very important uh, piece of crisis management that was being done, right? So when you think about science and technology, it's 58% of the budget is cut. When you think about security, to to talk about violence, the things that you're talking, is 54 percent, right? Uh, when you look at health, it's 14 percent, which is immense because uh, the Sistema Unico de Saúde was underfunded, right? So uh, I was shocked. I mean, what is going, do you think people are going to be at home? What is going to happen with these kinds of cuts for public investment and, uh, and social support and social things, right, and social uh, policies, right? Um, so uh, this uh, is a shocking thing for me, and this is something that is spreading out through WhatsApp. You know WhatsApp? The, uh, this is the main connection among popular, uh, among poor people in Brazil. It's a way of, of being, they don't have computers, Facebook, uh, it's not so strong as WhatsApp. So this is my piece on what they are doing with this, that I feel like a cup, a civil cup, right? Uh, we don't have a military. Civil coup. Civil coup, yeah, thank you. Cup, it's a different, it's a word cup. <laughs> too, too late in the night, right? But the coup, yeah. It's a civil cup, it's coup. like coup. Right? It's Francais. like en français, oui, je parle français. <laughs> Toujours. <laughs> and uh, it's not a coup de it's a cup, a coup, right? And, um, and we need to think that uh, one little thing that was talked about the other uh, uh, speakers that during uh, Fernando Henrique and Lula time, there was no general that spoke about military intervention, but we had it to, to 10 days ago. Okay, so Lula, even if it's Lula and Dilma were leftist and not uh, loved for the traditional uh, conservative spirit in Brazil, right? And if uh, something that is happening here, uh, Cold War discourses were used during whole the, the whole process of impeachment, which is very, the whole process of 
trying to, dis to destroy the leftists and the social democrats, in fact. Uh, I think uh, that we are growing up with a lot of people being in fear of demonstrating and being arrested. So two other scenes, right? There was uh, a guy that, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, 18 young people were arrested in last year, huge manifestation against Temer, which is much bigger than any other that you saw during the impeachment process, but you don't see it on media, you don't see the photos because the media is totally uh, uh, sided with, uh, with the impeachment process. The big media, I mean, the big televisions, the, you don't see the photos, but I was there, I saw it, right? So I, I can tell by my own experience. 18 young people were arrested because there was a military guy infiltrated in their conversation in WhatsApp. This was last year, 2016. They're being judged by being subversives, by being <laughs> opposition, by being terrorists, right? With nothing in their, in their uh, backpack, but masks for the nurses, right? Uh, some kind of uh, uh, water to protect from, from uh, tear, gas. tear gas. And they are being uh, uh, charged. judged. They were charged, they were, be they, they were going to be judged last week, right? I had two friends who fought with me in the dictatorship that commented I was afraid of going there. Right? People who confronted the dictatorship, two very close friends who said, I was afraid of being there. I'm glad you, the other friends, were there. But I was afraid of being arrested, of being prosecuted, because, and then I go to the people with fear, uh, my, uh, we, people are beginning to fear this kind of justice that is being done in Brazil. And I give you some more examples, some other examples. Mm -hmm. Uh, some judges, uh, the, the justice system is not uh, coherent, okay? They, it's, I mean, they are divided as this Brazilian society is divided. There are a lot of good judges that think about human rights, but we are having very difficult experiences with judges. And my brother, who is a, who is a writer and a journalist, wrote a piece in the last uh, Saturday, Estadão, Estado de São Paulo uh, uh, newspaper, who's called um, Fear of Justice. Why? Because in the last 15 days, we had the judge who allowed it for uh, treating homosexuality. I am, to, to I was- To cure homosexuality to treat and cure homosexuality, which is totally <laughs> no evidence based. On the contrary, we, we have a lot of evidence showing, connect, collected here, that on the contrary, gay people who go through those processes are, are worse than they were before. <laughs> we have this uh, data. And I mean, there is like 20 something years, 20 years of, uh, an, uh, of not doing that. Being, I was in the Council of Psychology for a long time and this was a decision from the psychiatry and we then have the psychiatry association, the medical association, the psychology association, the gay movement on streets last weekend against this judge, okay? Another judge for, uh, prohibited uh, one play that was about um, uh, o Evangelho segundo Jesus, the ev Evangelic uh, by Jesus, uh, Rainha do Céu, the Queen of the of uh, the Sky, which was a trans trans person who was incarnating Jesus. It was forbidden by a judge. Uh, there was a censor of a queer uh, museum. E exhibition in Porto Alegre by a judge also, right? And uh, that goes along and along and along and along. And then finally, last week also, we had uh, a very uh, 
uh, emblematic uh, prisoner, which was Rafael, one poor person, uh, uh, homeless person, ha that was the only person arrested in the 2013 movement because he had something that he was using to do cleaning right in his backpack. He was in prison for many years. He was uh, liberated by a judge to go back to his house, to a home, a domiciliar prison, which is like, can you see, he was a homeless person. He was freed from prison because he was with TB. He was sick for a long time. The judge allowed him to be treated uh, in his residence, <laughs> which is the street. So he went back to the street to get better with TB. So this is the fear of uh, growing, right? People are, f many people are fearing to demonstrate. But on the other side, I'm not, and am I ending with that because I would have time for that. Uh, uh, we have millions of people demonstrated against Tamar. We have uh, 30,000 people last week only in the city of Sao Paulo, Avenida Paulista, of people without fear. There is a social movement called People Without Fear, right? I saw it on YouTube. I saw it with, in Media Ninja, right? I can saw, I saw the people. I know a, a lot about manifestations and, and parades because I've been part of it, so I can count, right? <laughs> I can count. There were 30 million, 30,000 people in Paulista last Tuesday, right? Because they killed two ta one person who was homeless and uh, Saint Tetu, how do you call that? Uh, he was homeless. Homeless. Uh, in the homeless movement, 2,000 people uh, demonstrated in San Bernardo and they killed from uh, inside a building. They shot and killed one person. So they demonstrated there was nothing in the news. There was Nothing in the news. You see it in Media Ninja. You see a note in Folha de São Paulo. Nothing in TV Globo. Nothing in many other newspapers. And this is part of the problem. So I stop here. So um, as I want to emphasize, uh, people feel free to, to leave if they need to. Um, Brown Brazil Initiative is very committed to many different points of views and an uh, open and democratic dialogue and conversation. So uh, we're going to open up for three or four people who to say something, to ask a question, and then we'll let our panelists answer that, um, and then we'll do another round. We have some time. We have half an hour for the plan, so we have lots of time. So if anyone wants to ask a question, make a brief comment, um, the floor is open. Okay, so let's have one and two, third person. Yeah. Am I two? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Identify yourself maybe with concentration or something so we know who you are. Uh, I'm Beatrice. I'm a third year student at Brown. I'm concentrating in neuroscience. I'm, I'm from Brazil. Um, I have a question about the presentation about crime. Um, there was a graph in the beginning of the presentation showing the number of murders. And I think you showed the absolute number of murders, like the total number of murders. Is that right? Is that right? At the beginning, yes. Uh, yeah, I think the graph gave me the impression that the number of murders is increasing like exponentially. No, no. It was just Sorry, this first is uh, rates. Oh, those are rates. Yeah. I see. We have 11 in the 80s, then this increases to almost 30 in the last Yeah, because I had the impression that it was like absolute numbers and I was just like wondering if that could be a reflect of the increase in the number of the Brazilian population. Yeah. Oh, um, no, no, the rates were 100,000. And also, uh, I think there was another, in another slide, there was a comment that the index of, index of criminality in the Northeast increased a lot. And I was, the, um, wondering if that could be a reflex of like the increase of investment there because the population in their area was like neglected by all of the governments previous to the workers party government government and because um, there was like more investment in the region the population became more visible so 
crimes that wouldn't be counted started being counted, counted. the population that was invisible started to be more visible. And because of that, we have the impression that the index of criminality increased so much, but actually it wouldn't have increased so much. I, I was just wondering if that could be the case. If like the fact that the uh, if like the, the, the investments could actually like, have improved people's lives and uh, yeah, there wouldn't be a correlation between the increasing criminality and the place receiving more, more, more investment. And also, um, nothing was commented on the presentation about education being a solution. I think a lot was said about like the military and the police. But yeah, uh, my my mother is a public public school is a teacher in public schools in Brazil, and I think she has like observed how the population is suffering a lot with the decreasing investment in education the past few years. And yeah, um, Professor Vera Paiva mentioned that like people that have free time, they are going to get involved in crime because that's what is around them. Like she has had students who like were forced into pr prostitution by their parents, who were like seriously abused, who were like forced to sell drugs by their parents. And like having a stronger educational support, educational system could be like a, a, a possibly the biggest solution to that. Thank you, please. Yes, I, I'm Luis Valente. I'm a professor in Red Brown in Portuguese and Brazilian Studies and Comparative Literature. Just uh, a couple of questions for Vera Paiva. Um, let me preface my, my question and my remarks by saying that I never voted for Timur. I, and, on my, and on my conscience, it's perfectly <laughs> at peace. I never voted for Tamer for anything, for deputado, for vice president, for president. So I'm not responsible for Tamer, and the people who voted for him should be responsible for what he's been doing. I certainly don't approve a lot of the cuts that are being made in the current budget, but I'm wondering whether you would be prepared to acknowledge the role of the Dilma government in creating the economic mess and the budgetary crisis that we're currently facing in Brazil. Now, she inherited from Lula a tremendous uh, surplus that had been actually going on for several years and converted that surplus into a huge deficit. So at what point do we blame the Temer government without also blaming the Dilma government. The cuts to education began by the Dilma government. The cuts to the universities began under Dilma when Joaquin Levy was the minister of, uh, what was he minister of uh, in the economy? So this is what I, this is my first question. The second one is very, no, very, very briefly. I, I think we should be, uh, we should be wary of generalizing. There are many conservative judges in Brazil, and we certainly don't agree with them. But there are also many judges who do not agree with that conservative. Uh, for example, the exhibit in Porto Alegre that was censored, by, I believe by a judge, is going to be actually sh shown in Rio within the next few months. So I'm a little bit afraid, you know, I don't share your fear, and I'm a little bit surprised that someone like you, who fought against a against dictatorship, uh, would operate from the point of view of fear, because fear is extremely paralyzing. And we should not fear to protest. We should not be afraid to protest. We should not fear any consequences. And even if there are problems in Brazil right now, I think the country is whether people um, everybody would be willing to agree or not. It is a demo uh, it is a functioning democracy to a large extent, and I will stop here. And more questions before Abner and uh, Matheus, and then we'll let the panel uh, answer if they want. Someone wants to. So my name is Abner, um, and uh, I'm here. Uh, uh, I'm here part of the Portuguese and Brazilian Studies Department. Uh, I have a PhD program. Um, 
So I have, uh, I'd like to share first an impression and, and an opinion, and, and, and then later maybe uh, a couple of questions. One of them is really, um, I'm under the impression that sometimes, um, and, and this comes from talking to people my age, between 25 and 35 years of age, I feel that sometimes people of my generation feel like stumped and paralyzed by what's happening right now. And uh, may maybe to make a, a kind of contrast with, uh, with the American reality, not the current administration because I think it's a different thing, but the American history of backlash. I think my generation right now is not used to the reality of backlash in which you have some time of, of, of advancement when it comes to, to social policies, economic policies, and at the same time, right after, you have a political movement a as a response to that, maybe, maybe a conservative movement. And I feel that here in the US, because uh, the, the democratic institutions have been uh, maybe stronger uh, for a little bit longer, uh, people are more used to having different voices in, in, in politics, taking uh, just switching places, and sometimes you have a Democrat, sometimes you have a Republican, and I feel that part of the, the, the comment that my colleague over there made in the first, uh, in the first uh, comment, maybe education could help in that sense, because I feel that most of my friends, they are paralyzed and pessimistic, because they, I feel that it may Part of the reason might be some kind of historical, um, the lack of a historical overview that that's how democracy works. Sometimes you have, a, you know, like a government acting just the way you want them to act, and then after four years you have somebody who's trying to dismantle everything that you believe in. But it's it's messy, it's hard, it's painful. But democracy is supposed to be like that. So I wonder if you if you if you would take into consideration that aspect of what democracy is and what role democracy, or actually, I'm sorry, education would play into helping people process those changes and process the, the, the backlash as a, as, a, as, a, as a thing, as something that really exists and should exist. I think backlash should exist because when there's some th someone on the right in the government that we disagree with them, for them, it's backlash, right? When we when we resist. So same thing with us. Um, second thing, um, uh, I, I appreciate the analysis on uh, the, ex the amount of money spent on, 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 on the breakdown or the crackdown on crime. But at the same time, I wonder um, whether that is kind of playing into a narrative that Brazil, in a sense, has been the victim of, of, of being a reactive kind of government. For me, the crackdown on crime sometimes reflects a reactionary way of dealing with a problem. And uh, although there should be money there, and there should be studies, there should be research, there should be people thinking about how to improve you know, like the criminal justice system and, and the, the penitentiaries and, and like the, the jailing system. Also, how about also having as a kind of priority what comes before the crime? What comes, you know, in, in the formation of people, in education? And uh, unfortunately, I know what you mean when you say that when it comes to the budget, the government in general, local government, state, and, and like in the state level or national level, they are not investing as much or as, as much as they should. Still, it is always in the campaign. The, the backlash, or, or I'm sorry, the crackdown on crime is always a campaign subject. People vote on that. You know, so it's not, it's not forgotten. Hmm? Here. In Brazil. In Brazil, like when, when you have a candidate and then they like, promise to bring like peace and security, uh -huh. people vote on that, right? So I think there's a disconnect here between the political discourse and the, the will of the nation and the way that things end up happening. So how does that play out? And uh, is there a solution? How, how does that work? 
because it's not in the budget, but it's in the discourse. Look, how, why does that happen, and or what what can be done about it? Mateus, and then we'll let the panelists um, comment. Uh, uh, I have a question, a more specific question for for Claudio, and then a bigger one for all the, the three panelists and whoever wants to share their thoughts. Uh, the first one is that. Uh, as an engineer myself, and I'd like to uh, just disagree with the thing of the putting more force will improve it because uh, I disagree. Uh, <laughs> you disagree with that? Yeah, this is just an example. Okay, I understand the wrong thing. It's a logical strategy. Uh, but the thing is that I can see that a lot of the problems that we have, budgetary problems, uh, even you know, management problems, like they come from the processes that we have instituted, not formally, most of the time not formally, been to a bunch of places that they have these very little habits that they developed along the way, they, they call it processes, but they've never been formalized. So I wonder if, if you could identify, in this case you identified one regarding the, 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 the criminality, fighting criminality, right? If there are other processes that you believe that should be taken care of, how we will optimize that? A specific, like specific guidelines, like a, a focus area that you would say that it would be the most immediate right now to focus on. And the other question says for everyone to think of, so what can we do about it? Like from this perspective, myself and other people like me, I guess, people my age at least, my generation. What can we do? About it? Like, what can we? What do you think we should do to engage in a better country, to make a better country? And that can be to any perspective. I just want you know some direct directions, I guess. So I'll let any of the panelists answer any of the questions they wish they answer. Can I? Sure. Uh, just two things. Um, did you hear me saying that it was somebody else fault? No, I was thinking uh, 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 culpa, guilt, right? I was not thinking about who began it. I'm thinking about the future of the country. I'm not an economist. That's why I begin telling you that I'm social. I'm a social psychologist doing public health, so I'm positioned in the place of somebody who is doing public policy. Right. You, but you alluded only to the period, to the recent period. Yeah, that's what you're talking think. about Brazil. <laughs> what is going to happen so in Brazil? Brazil? You know, uh, the current period in Brazil began yesterday? No, uh, I think this doesn't, this, uh, sorry, I, I think this kind of, I'm not an economist, and I think this is not an economical problem. I'm talking, I'm thinking about the future of Brazil, yeah, I think but what you is going. It as an economic problem. No, I present it as a budget. No, I. So okay, we want to let the speaker yeah, answer yeah. and then yeah. encourage. I was just debate. saying no, that. Don't put words into my mouth because you know that. Uh, yes. That's not what yes. I was yes. Yes. Yeah. I know. You know. So, so I'm sorry if you. Did, I did. I hear you okay. badly. But I think I, what I'm saying is that I, I'm not. Into, I'm not discussing the past. I'm discussing the future. I'm very worried what is going to happen with this kind of budget. That's my thing, right? I I, I was never part of the, any government. I, I began saying that I was very critical of all of governments, and I was part of the public policy production in many governments. I begin saying that, try not to polarize <laughs> the discussion. So I'm not an, an economist. I'm just worried which, what is going to happen with the country, with this kind of cutting. You know, That's my thing. I'm looking further. I'm, I'm trying to think what is going to happen to the country, right? And the poor people who depend on this kind of the, of, so it's done. The past is done. I'm, I'm wondering what we do about the future, right? And the last thing I would do was to fear myself. I was, I'm a resilient person trying to fight with a lot of courage. What I'm trying to describe you is that there is two kinds of people that I meet in Brazil, in the favelas, in middle class, in the university, in social movements. Some of them could be identified as as we call as I called P 
people without fear. They don't fear to be arrested. They don't fear to be to be killed because they were last week. They don't fear to have bombs in their face. They don't fear to lose an eye, as two people already did it in the last movements, because we didn't do the transitional uh, justice that we should have done in 30 years, as he said, nobody touched in this case, in this thing, and transitional justice allowed the torture to continue, military police to continue, and this kind of security. So what I'm saying is that some people are backing from the resistance. You know, because they are afraid. They are looking at peers being affected, deeply affected. Uh, the teachers and, and students who demonstrated against the, the in, in high school movement, I don't know if you saw that uh, the, the last year, are being, per, uh, are being visited by policemen in their houses, right? I saw that in the favelas I work, in the, the schools I work in, around the city. Uh, policemen are going into the favelas and taking the mother and say, if your kid continue to be in the strike, I will kill him. Or another mother who was denouncing the massacre of Osasco was followed by a policeman. I saw all of this in, in, the, in, the, in the National Commission of Human Rights, right? I saw it directly. An another uh, mother who lost her kid in the massacre of Osasco uh, was followed for a policeman and said, if you keep resisting, I will ki kill your, the other kid. So this is what I mean. There is two things. There is fear from one side, and there is people without fear in the other side, right? That understand and try to think how democracy works. And you're totally right. I'm, 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 as I'm trying to answer you. It is about democracy, right? But the thing is that democracy is not equal for everybody in Brazil right now. That's my feeling. I'm sorry. It's not, okay? If you are leftist, if you are fighting for some kind of social justice, you have less democracy, less fair judgment than if you're not. Uh, this is clear. People are fearing that. That's what I'm telling you, right? And this is real. I have many, 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 many situations. And what strikes me more, it's why liberal people are not saying anything about that, because they are focus on economy. They just want to think about structural adjustment. They're just thinking about who did the bad thing in the economy. And we are going into a very dangerous piece that a very fragile moment of our democracy and liberal people doesn't say a word about that. They should be protesting against this kind of things, you know, and they are not. So, and this is part of the experience of democracy. You're totally right, you know. Uh, and I think part of my depression, I began to speak about my depression, is that maybe we thought people who fought dictatorship and are still there doing that, and I'm doing that, I don't fear that, right? I'm people without fear, thought maybe that it would be stabilized, would be done. And I have my, a good uh, professor at uh, sociology department in USP who has a thesis that is beautiful, and he always says, democracy is built by and through every single generation. It's not done. It's never done, right? You can have a country like this that you have a better institutional strength. But in Brazil, it's very fragile. So you, you're totally right about how democracy works. It is like this, right? OK, um, I would like to begin with the question, what we can do? Because let me explain what I do. In, in my university, I'm, I'm the director of a center that uh, in public policy in security is different. It's not only academic study of the reasons and the causes of crime, but in public policy. Or this means uh, to search for solutions. Um, uh, I, I can talk a little bit more about this, but we have a lot of solution on this. Because you are right, and you also, in the term, in the sense that well, the, the new generation are becoming despaired with this situation. There is nothing that we can do. And I think that there is a lot of things that we can do, especially in security. Security is important because it's the less developed field in public administration in Brazil. There is no other field that advances less than, than the public security. 
education advance a lot, health advance, we have the SUS, we have more education, not so good as we, we need, but there is a lot of advances. And security not, we have, uh, and, and in my center I always say it's easy to accuse the police officer, for example, for because they are killing extra officially, because there is a lot of criminals. But the difficult thing is, what can I do to change the police? I think this is the important thing that we can do uh, in Brazil. We have to search for a solution for our huge problems that we have, not only in security, but I think in different, in human rights and, and citizenship for different groups. But it's not accusing. We have to, to take into account just the public policy, the, the, the idea to study and, and, and how to arrive in solution. Well, on this, I would like to, to point about the role of education. Education is very important. One of the projects that we made there in Belo Horizonte, and then this become a, a, a Latin American reference that called Fica Vivo. And one of the things that we did is just to uh, talk with youth people in favelas. It won one of, one of the things that impressed me more is the how they do nothing in the favelas, the youth people. When they go to Mondays, an afternoon they are drinking beer, nothing to do. And the project on the first uh, stage was just putting them to study, to have some activities, to have some kind of training, different fields or sports or something like this in some specific favela. Because one of the problems that we have in Brazil is that when we try to find out some solution for crime, we have to attack all the city. It's not possible. We have to choose, and then you have to, to have a good information where the things happen, and then we can develop some specific project. This, this is the importance to study the crime problem has you have to study uh, education problem, and I think that. Well, when you have more information, good evidence in what to do, you, I think that you can uh, go out from the reactive response to the crime problem. This is the problem that we have in Brazil. That police organization, for example, but not police organization, justice also, it's, they are always making a reaction about a thing that just happened. No, they have it to, to, to anticipate on the problem, on the case of the police. And use a lot of evidence. I, I used to, I, I, make the, I made the, the reference here to the Lava Jato because there is some important aspect that Lava Jato is, is, is really innovating a lot in terms of just in Brazil. First of all, they use a lot of evidence. The, the, the amount of paper and proof and evidence and track the banking accounts in the world is huge. They, they, they develop uh, a specific software just to track the transaction. And this changed completely, for example, for the defense lawyers in Brazil, because when they go to, to, to discuss with Sergio Moro, for example, they have mountains of evidence against him. And this is difficult. This is changing how the law works in Brazil. Why? Because in the civil law tradition, the laws work in terms of rhetorical. Depends of Latin lawyers talking Latin, lawyers talking in rhetoric, but not proofs and evidence and things. This is the good, uh, the good part of this. There is some odd bad parts that they are, of course, we can discuss this. But one of the things important, the police, the federal police is working completely different way. Uh, and, the, and that is the same that we have to do in terms of the police. Well, finally, I would like to, to, to mention about your idea that uh, Northeast was increased their crime rates. It's because it's interesting, because Northwest, it's becoming better under the government. And, and one thing that we never uh, think about is that development have ugly side faces also. Development is not only good things. Develops brings together the deterioration of cities, the inequality, spatial inequality. This is the reason because good governance have to intervene, trying to 
minimize the bad effects that development have some. And this never happens in Brazil. In fact, we have in the last 30 years governments, left governments, that they never stop to think about security. This is the, our problem. They never stop. For example, the bad things that could happen when you improve the conditions of some people there, and this uh, uh, worse the situation of security. No? And, and uh, I think I have a theory, it's a, it's a common sense theory, that because a lot of them are Marxian uh, thinkers. They think that if you solve the economic problems, the rest will be happens naturally. It's not true. Because when we solve economic problems, we will create another economic problems. You will create another inequality, and you have to be prepared to uh, fight this bad effects, this perverse effect that development have some time. And this is happens in, in, in Northeast. Northeast, for example, is the case of very bad mismanagement in terms of public security. No? Because they have one of the worst police organizations and one of the worst governors to manage this problem. And this is another thing. In the last 30 years, we have a, a problem, a recurrent problem that is police organization. When you heard in the elections about police reform in Brazil? Never. Never, ne no, 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 no one wants to talk about police reform because police are huge organizations. They can stabilize a, a government and they, they don't like to, to speak about this. But this is particularly central to our citizenship now in Brazil, is how to democratize the police organizations. No? And this is uh, the reasons I think that the left is governed and, and, and in. Oh, we are lucky. I'm, I'm more optimist. I'm more optimist because I believe that our institutions are working despite of all things that are happening. But uh, <clears throat> and we are lucky that our rights think that we have the right thinkers. We have some crazy people like Bolsonaro or some general that sometimes say some crazy things. And he's not being punished for doing that. But he was not punishing. Yeah, you are right. Well, I, I don't believe in which, but que lazai, lazai, no? Depois pode ser que eu pague com a língua, né? But the idea is that in the next election, I think that institution will be working, no? Despite of all this happening, and uh, probably the parties that will be at the end of the electoral are the traditional, because Brazil is a conservative society. The traditional parties will uh, continue to work, no? And and this is important. But well, but you can talk more about this. So Abner is our last speaker tonight yep. because we're reached our evening end. So mm -hmm. okay, uh, I have a lot of uh, things to talk, but I don't have time. So I will select uh, two points. Uh, so first of so loudly, you know, okay, first of all, uh, institution we're not a building, you know. When we talk that institutions uh, are work well or work in Brazil, in my point of view, it's a mixed conception of the sense of democracy in Brazil. So when do you consider that uh, structural racism in Brazil that attacked the majority of the population in Brazil, you have to think about democracy and the sense of democracy. You know, so when do you think about education? Example, uh, the last years, uh, decades, uh, Brazil uh, increased a lot the quality and the quantity of uh, established or uh, school, university. Uh, but when do you disappear uh, people who receive uh, this education, we have uh, a problem, or when do you think about violence? Uh, because that I think the police have to be uh, charged uh, because they is responsible, because uh, police is a uh, part of the state, no a separate group, no uh, group aside of government. So we have to charge the police 
Uh, because uh, when you consider security and education in Brazil, and you try to do a uh, policy to resolve or to solve the problem, uh, normally, especially in conservative group, in conservative government, they don't consider the difference between, example, uh, race in Brazil. So when do you consider, uh, especially in conservative mind? I think because of this, because that uh, PT party was deposed uh, in the government in 2016. Because I think it's the uh, PT don't solve this problem, but put on the table to talk about it in different way. Uh, despite the fact that during in 2006, in 2006, uh, the new law that punished the use of drug put more than 104 uh, million people in the prison, despite the fact that the map of violence in Brazil uh, have an interesting uh, situation. The same, the same time that crime against uh, right people decreased 20%, 20% against black people arise 20%. So how? I can't understand how I can affirm that institution uh, yes. is work well, even now, or mean now. So when do you think about education or security system, you have to uh, put it on the table. Because we have a different Brazil, everybody knows. Go to the institution, go to university, even in Brazil. Think about the Ciencias Sem Frontera. When do you consider the aspect of race, the people uh, who receive this police policy? policy. policy. So we have. A, a, when do you think about the Brazilian situation? It's impossible, or we don't have to consider in the superficial way the problem that black people in Brazil have faced. Because it looks like a mask, you know? So uh, in my point of view, uh, the institution in Brazil nowadays don't work, or don't work uh, how you need that we have to work. Uh, in my point of view, when do you think education in Brazil, we have a different uh, asset in education in Brazil, consider the aspect of a race and gender too. Uh, so I don't have more time to do, to speak, uh, but uh, the sense of democracy nowadays in Brazil, despite the fact that Temer was voted, but he doesn't vote with the Ponte para o Futuro, yeah. he doesn't vote this with a travessia, the the problem created by PSDB, PMDB, or the, a part of PSDB, a part of uh, Democrats, the party that is against. Example, uh, polix, polix, pol, uh, police policy, no. policy. Uh, affirmative act in Brazil. Nowadays, the uh, Minister of Education in Brazil is a polit politi politician. politician who is against the sense of democracy in education. The Democrat go to the justice against police uh, affirmative action in Brazil. And now this uh, conservative coalition leader by Temer, PSDB, PSD, uh, choose uh, Mendonça de Barro to be uh, our education minister. It's a problem. How I can affirm this uh, institution are working. working very well. Thank you. So I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Ramon Stern for helping organize this event. And uh, thank you all for coming. This is the first of a series of activities. If you want to get a sheet for um, Brazil Initiative Activities, or if you want to get onto our Son of Sheet, just send an email to brazil at brown.edu. 
We look forward to seeing you all at our luncheon time debates and uh, 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 lectures this semester and uh, for other activities this, this, this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.